Uh, we found either three or four murder victims in the, in the history of our company. When things go well, the CEO gets too much credit. And when things go poorly, the CEO gets too much blame. I can help you find electrical conduits so that you can avoid cutting them. And he looked at me and said, why would I ever do that? Our best sales call is a job well done. And if you just look within and, and, and find your why, you can be an elite performer in, in whatever it is that you're doing. You ever have one of those projects and won't die? I was getting an email this morning about a project that was mostly done in 2019. Like I remember working, it's almost like a nightmare, right? It's like a bad dream. I worked on it during the pandemic. I remember this. I worked on this job. You said it and I, I shuddered a little bit. I was like, oh, no, okay. there's so many people that worked on this job that aren't with us anymore. You know, I mean, they are physically with us still, but they aren't with our company anymore. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that one came back this morning and it was just like, okay, all right, that's how we're going to start the day today. So, okay. That's how the day started for me. <laughs> I'm just, I'm coping right now. <laughs> With the realities of construction, this is where we are at. Things just keep surfacing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, thanks for joining us this I'm week. Glad <laughs> to do it. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, so, yeah, man. Well, yeah. uh, let's start with who you are, what you do. So, yeah, my name is Matt Aston, and I'm the founder of a company called GPRS. Uh, it originally stood for ground penetrating radar systems. Still does, but you know, there's a lot more than just ground penetrating radar that we do uh, now. But uh, started it in 2001. Uh, I was the the only employee at, at the time in, in the in the business, and we've been blessed, and it has grown. Uh, we're now almost 800 people strong, and uh, in 54 cities across <laughs> the United States. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of questions on the entrepreneurial side today, for sure. Very, very good. I love I love I love, I love talking about it. It's so, it's yeah. awesome, man. Well, um, so let's start off with ground penetrating radar, All right? So that's. Kind of that was the bread and butter that you started everything on. What is that? Give us kind of that that high level look at it. Yeah, so really it's, it's just a way to look into the ground and identify anomalies. So the radar sends an electromagnetic pulse from the antenna and on the screen it displays the data based on changes in the electrical properties of different materials that it encounters. So yeah, we, we are... When we started, our, our focus was really in concrete applications where you know, we could lay out reinforcing steel, rebar post-tension cables so they could be avoided when someone wanted to core you know, through a slab. Well, really easy to see a yeah, very homogeneous you know, concrete slab, very easy to see a steel bar you know, jump off, jump off the screen at you. And we were able to kind of draw the exact reinforcing grid onto the surface so they could just position their drill in between. But so we started with that focus on concrete, but over time we shifted more towards utility and identifying utilities prior to excavation and then underground storage tanks for environmental applications. And then you know, we've gotten into finding voids where we just did a job at a refinery where we, um, scan the entire thing, looking looking for voids and their, on their pathways between their production units. Uh, so over the last 22 years, we've uncovered a lot of unique applications. And then people hear about ground penetrating radar and sometimes that uh, takes us into some places we didn't really expect. As, well. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, as I'm sure, yeah. yeah. We, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll get into that. So what I thought was interesting is like, you kind of were like on the front end of, of using some of this technology, but your dad kind of inspired you to start this? He did, yeah. So when I was three years old, my dad started a company uh, in Toledo, where I'm, where I'm from, called Ohio Concrete Sawing and Drilling. His, he had worked for a concrete cutter before and thought, you know, I, I, can, I can do this. And uh, he, so he started his business in 1980 and got hurt in a church softball game. He tore his ACL in a, a softball game. So don't get me started on church softball <laughs> games for the record. <laughs> so <Keep going. laughs> it, it forced him to do what he was probably putting off. Yeah. And that it forced him to, he was, he was still out on the saw or on the drill. And when he couldn't walk, he had to find someone else to, to put on the saw and on the drill. So it was a blessing for him in, in disguise. But 
yeah, he was able to duplicate himself and then he's able to do it over and over and over again. And so they grew to be a, a pretty good size outfit. He's not involved with it anymore, but uh, they had probably 200 trucks between Ohio and Michigan and Florida. So yeah, it was a, it was a good business. And I talked to him about going into business with him and initially he said, you know, that'd be great. And then about a week later, he came back to me and said, I think you should probably try something on your own. Uh, he, he, years later, he told me that he thought I would have this element of self doubt if I just, if I bought the business from him, if I could have built it from zero. And I was a little irritated with him at the time when, when he said, no, I think you should go try something on your own. But, uh, no, what what a favor. I mean, I, one, of, one of the best favors anybody's ever done for me is to kind of push me into you know, doing something on my own. That's cool. We've got the, the family business story and um, maybe the opposite side of the story to a certain extent. We've run parallel in business too. So 2001, you kind of start up on your own. I wouldn't have even imagined this technology was very prevalent at that time. There were, <laughs> it was actually scary. There were about, we knew about five or six companies in the U.S. that were providing this as a service, uh, uh, mostly focused on the concrete side of the business again. And I had made arrangements with an individual, uh, we'll call it in the central U.S., um, where I was going to go ride with him for a few days and just get a better understanding of, I was, I was pretty green. I was 24 years old when I started GPRS. And I was going to go ride with this guy for a few days. And about a week before I was supposed to go, he called me and said, hey, cancel your trip. I'm, I'm, I'm shutting this down. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. And he was doing a job at a critical facility and he missed a high voltage electrical, con electrical conduit. And they cut through it. They shut the facility down. And he said, there's just too much, there's too much risk here. I, I'm not sleeping at night. You know, we're wondering if they're gonna, if, I, if I'm accurate. So, you know, forget it. And yeah. Golly. But you ran through that headwind. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, in spite of it all. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. So the, the, the training was in New Hampshire. So I, on the way out there, I didn't really fully understand what I was getting into yet. So on the way out there, I was, I was a little scared and flying home from that training. <laughs> really? I was, I was terrified. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? How is this going to work? Yeah. I, I basically know how to turn this system on, but how to apply this on actual jobs where, where people are really going to be expecting me to perform and do exactly what this, this is going to be tough. So it took a lot of practice on my own after the training I went to, which was like two or three days at the manufacturer's facility. I spent probably the next two or three months going to job sites and just basically offering to do work for free just so I could gain some experience and, and some knowledge about, okay, I, the training center, they, they build the slab and everything's perfect in it. But that's not the way it works on the real site. Yeah, it, it, there's, it's, it's not going to be that easy. And so I, 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 had to, I had to expose myself to some real world elements before I could go say that I was competent to do this and charge a fee for what I was offering yeah. the customer at the time. I can see why you were nervous though. Like the, the photo that you showed us earlier with all the different markings on the ground, I'm like, golly, that can get super complex. And so, I'm sure that's kind of clean even in some cases. <laughs> so I couldn't do that today. I, I, enough, I've got yeah. enough self-awareness to understand that what, what GPRS project managers do in the field today is beyond my capability. They, they, they've advanced beyond, they, they, they keep advancing beyond the levels of, you know, what I was capable of when I was in the field. It's been, uh, geez, 17 years since since I've spent time in the field. Do you still get the bug from time to time though? Like you're like, I, I, I want to go out and do this just because I, I used to love this. Yeah, maybe <laughs> three weeks ago, yeah. <laughs> I, was in, I was in Dallas, you know, just on, on a market visit, you know, with, with our guys. And, uh, got to go visit some cool job sites. You know, we were on a uh, a solar farm installation. It was it was day one, and we were out there. There was 196 soil borings over 
acres and acres and acres of, of property, like an hour north of Dallas. And it was, it, it was cool to ride with the guys and, and see how our team attacked that job. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it, it is nice to get back out there and get your hands dirty a little bit and, and say, yeah, this, this, this is what's, this is what's driving our business. This is, this is what's, yeah, to get a taste of it again, it is, it's, it's really great. I want to I want to hijack the conversation for a nerd moment okay. because I want to know a little bit about the the tools. How are you doing this, or or what do we have? We'll say these days in order to um, to perform the work. And like this isn't some like gigantic tool that you're taking large sweeps of an area and just all of a sudden it's being. Guys. laid out on the ground and you're just tracing like guys I, I i gotta be honest i keep going back to jurassic park where they take the shotgun shell and shoot it in the ground and get the velociraptor on the screen that's what i'm thinking of immediately <laughs> like when we talked about it the first time <laughs> no it it looks like a baby stroller you know for yeah. for our utility work it, it it looks like a baby stroller and then our concrete work now it's about a four inch square box yeah so we can use it in as this pretty tight space, but yeah, the, the the principle is exactly the same. There's there's just a frequency that leaves the antenna, and as as we push it, there's a servo wheel that moves, and as that wheel moves, it tells the signal to you know, transmit the data onto the screen, and we we look for the anomalies. Then then we're trained in how to map those anomalies from what we see on the screen onto the surface. Then we've developed a process we call SIM, subsurface investigation methodology, where you know, it leads to, you know, last year we were 99.87 accuracy on, on the work that we did. We did about 120,000 jobs nationally last year and um, 99.87 accuracy. So very proud of that. Our goal is 100% subsurface damage prevention. We're not quite there, but we're, we're, we're getting closer. Um, but yeah, the, the typical equipment in our in our truck is a few GPR antennas, a couple for underground, and one specifically for for concrete, and that covers probably ninety nine percent of the applications that we use GPR on. But then we have some tools that we we supplement the GPR with. So a lot of this, the state one call, the eight one one guys that go out, the contract locators. The, the wands that you'll see them use, every single one of our truck has those. We would not be able to do what we do without that equipment. There's there's limitations that are associated with, with GPR that we can't necessarily overcome. So by supplementing with some additional equipment, that's how, that's how we're able to receive those uh, or achieve those 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 results. Uh, 90, 90s, 87. There's a few other services that we perform, video pipe inspection, where we run the cameras through the sewer systems to identify deficiencies or degradation within or cross bores that have been drilled through the, the pipe unintentionally. Uh, we've got lasers. We've got about 24, 25 3D laser scanners yeah, uh, yeah, spread around the country. And then now our, our newest service is uh, leak detection. Mm. So finding water leaks, yeah, which are prevalent. I heard you explain this. Can, can you share with the share with the class what what it takes to detect a leak? Because it's it's audio, right? It is. Yeah. So we're we're listening. Yeah. We've we've got a box that we set over the. So the first thing you have to do, you've got to find the pipe first. So that that work that fits well into into what we do. We, we can find the pipe, but then you've got to you know, move this box and place it over the pipe, and you've got to listen for flow, and then keep moving the box. And then move it back and forth, and, and until you find the, this this change, where it, it 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 takes a lot of training, a lot of practice to to get to the point where you can be confident. Because the last thing that anyone looking for a leak, or, I mean, the last thing you want to say is, "Hey, I've, I've got one here." Then you bring out the excavator and you bring out the crew, <laughs> and it's bone dry when you yeah, when you when you get down right, to the yeah. pipe. So no, put the jackhammer yeah, right uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Dang it! <laughs> no, 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 over there. No, no. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But our, our our team's done a great job with this, and I mean, so you got you know, small water lines, even you know, residential lines, and they can they can find these leaks with within. I would with, imagine with that like inches sometimes yeah. musicians might be pretty good at that. 
Right, right. like because if you're detecting yeah. little little nuancey things in there, I wonder if I'd be good at that. I'd like to try my hand at this. I, th- I think patience is is, that, is, that, is really the key. That yeah. I lack. And, and, that I and, lack. And, <laughs> yeah, because well, if you're looking for the, the the reality is, if you're looking for a leak, you want there to be a leak, right? You, of course. Yeah. And and so, yeah, I would gravitate toward. Okay. That might be a leak. It probably is. And, You're right, right. And no, I think a more thorough, yeah, slow it down, a more thorough investigation before you commit to, hey, there's a leak here. And that, that's how you avoid some of those, those dry spots. Mm-hmm. Have you had to develop any sort of like training programs within the business? Because like you, you've grown this thing so much over the years. Have you had to do some sort of internal training stuff to oh. like... How, it, do, how does that operate? Can it, you give us kind of a yeah? That, that's that's the that's really the key behind our success is, yeah. is that our people are our, definitely the key. But you know, part of that is our people in the training. And we have three you know, full time you know, former project managers who are just dedicated to to training new people and our experienced project managers as, as they come back for advanced training or training on a new piece of equipment. But we bought a facility a few years ago. Um, one of the first things we did, it was a 17,000 square foot warehouse. And then one of the first things we did was we hired my, my dad's company, mm-hmm. Ohio Concrete, to cut out about 3,200 square feet. And then we had we worked with some engineers and some builders to draw up a slab. Yeah. And with with post tension cables, with conduits, with Smurf tube. Do you guys call it Smurf tube down here? The the the, the flexible conduits that can kind of go. I haven't heard that. I haven't oh, heard that okay. one. Now <laughs> so it, yeah. it, it's common on the West Coast for sure. Okay. So it, it's just a flexible conduit that yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, can, okay. you can yeah. kind of bend any any which way. Yeah. And, you, and uh, so that that that's mixed into our slab. Uh, but then yeah, so it's a, a mix of rigid and plastic, and then we put this pink foam on the bottom because that pink foam simulates air underneath. So it's a it's a thirty two hundred square foot slab on grade, but a lot of the work that we do was on elevated decks. So we put that pink foam underneath to so it, it looks like it's on an elevated deck, even though it's not. Uh, but then yeah, so mixing in bursting steel, mixing in beams. I mean, everything that our guys are going to see on a site, you know, we, we basically built it over this 3,200 square foot slab. Then we built a simulated gas station with underground utilities. And uh, so, yeah, we've got a phenomenal, you know, one of a kind you know, training center. And then uh, we do train all of our project managers. They come back to our headquarters for two weeks. And one of the weeks is spent at the University of Toledo. It's mm. a it's a four hundred acre campus that they've basically give, opened up to us, and in exchange for us helping them find utilities, we can train new project managers in this real world setting. Uh, so it's been it's been a great partnership. Yeah, I, I would imagine that training is is the key to anything like this. I want to dig back a little bit though, because before current day, so you had done Trump Tower. Oh yeah. That was pretty interesting. So I, I, but I noticed you guys were trying to find Nelson studs on a bridge. Is that we right? We weren't trying to find them necessarily. So okay. when that was in, that was summer of 06. Yeah. In downtown Chicago, it used to be the Chicago Sun-Times building. Yeah. And they demoed that. It's right at Michigan Avenue and the river. Yeah, yeah. And they demoed the Sun-Times building, but there was this bridge that starts at Michigan Avenue and extends west to Wabash. And it's just a five or six inch concrete slab, but it's supported by these I-beams. And when when the Trump organization bought that property, they, they bought the rights to that bridge. Well, to build the building on it, they had to make sure this bridge was up to code. And city of Chicago code was, there has to be Nelson studs, every nine inches along every one of those beams supporting that slab on that on that bridge deck. So our scope was to lay out every I-beam supporting the, the deck and then to lay out all of the steel that was perpendicular to every I-beam. So then the drillers would come right behind us and core a hole down to the top of the beam, pull out the core slug, then steel iron workers would come in and 
weld the stud in place down to the top of the beam. Then they pour it back, you epoxy it in, pour a little topping slab over it. And they had to do that every nine inches. It worked out to, I still remember the number. It was 3,892 locations along that along that bridge deck. Talk so, about tedious. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was tedious. <laughs> so, all right. So, and the measure of, of, okay, that's pretty tedious. Have there been more tedious jobs? Oh, that? oh, 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 That's what I want to hear about. What, what's the most tedious one that you can recall? We had a job at a, at a power plant um, where they wanted probably a 200 foot long, probably uh, 40 feet high. Mm-hmm. Every single rebar mapped out in, in, that, in that wall. So a foot thick. So yeah, front bar and back bar on, on, on and yeah, probably eight to 10 inches on center. And they wanted every single bar yeah, marked on that wall. And we did it. <laughs> then, and then we came in with the laser. Yeah. And we gave them a model right. of everything that we, so we'd be scanned and everything, put it into the model and they had, they had a full 3D model of all the reinforcing steel within that wall. Yeah, this is an interesting process that I think, you know, I have, I have an isolation thought through this because of, well, I mean, we have jobs that need exactly what you do, but then we also laser scan them, right? And you're like, well, yeah, we do that too. And so the idea of the workflow being, I'm going to go out and I'm going to identify what's in the slab. I'm going to paint it on the slab. Then I'm going to scan the slab. And now with that laser scan, because I have a picture, I can bring that back into a model. Now I can have elevation of that object and like, now I'm starting to give myself something of a starting point in 3D that I can then translate that into a and what I, would it be an as-built BIM, right? So, and I'm I'm thinking, hey, this would be a great idea, but you guys are ahead of that. <laughs> You're doing that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing it. We just did a neat job. Uh, on a 26, you know, concrete, 26 story concrete structure, post-tension concrete. And it's being repurposed. Yeah. So a lot of new penetrations for plumbing and electrical and communications. And before the trade showed up onto the site, the general contractor had us come out and we marked out all the post-tensioning systems, you know, I think on half of the floors. Then we brought in the laser behind. So then now they've got, they've got this BIM model of each of the floors with the exact reinforcement plan you know, over the entire thing. So they can actually, they're, now they're planning all of their electrical and mechanical penetrations, you know, communications around this BIM model. So laying out walls to be within you know, the areas, avoiding the post-tension cables. And it, it's, it's worked out wonderfully. Well, you guys, I mean, what's the level of accuracy on something that, like that for like, I know that this is about uh, three inches from the face of the slab or like how, how accurate can you give that? On a post-tension cable? Sure, yeah. yeah. I would say to the center of a tendon, probably within an eighth of an inch. An eighth. Yeah, I would feel confident. That let's say we had number four bar and the number four bar were six inches on center. I would feel extremely confident with you drilling a four inch hole in between the, 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 uh, four, the six inch grid yeah. without, without touching steel. You'd be like, thread the needle here. Boom. I, I could do that. Yeah. I could do that. So if I, if I can do that, <laughs> our, 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 our project managers can do that. No problem. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking through, maybe on the design side of this, like I have that as built and now that's going to inform how I'm going to go about, you know, penetrations, different things like this. Um, and there's got to be a little bit of a level of, you know, kind of a, red light, yellow light, green light with things? Yeah, I would not, I would not recommend just going to drill off of that, off that plan, off yeah. that BIM model. Yeah. But it gives, for planning purposes, I think it gives uh, 
a huge head start as to, as to where we were. I mean, what if you laid out a wall you know, that's running right over the top of a group of banded cables? That'd be a problem. Yep. And it, so it's, it's, I think some of those larger change orders from yeah, moves can be avoided yeah, if something like this is done in advance. Yeah, like I'm, I'm thinking through making design decisions about how I'm going to run whatever needs to run through plumbing or whatever kind of, and I'm I'm going to go with you know a safe area. Like I'm going to pick logic that would support. I'm I'm very I'm highly unlikely to hit something here. Therefore, I'm going to use this area. Like I've got a nice little sweet spot here. I don't have to be super duper accurate. Um, or if I do have to be super accurate now, like I'm going to address that, but I'm going to try to isolate those down to as few as possible. Sure. Um, it just, it makes the, it makes the mind kind of run. Um, the detailer is showing right now. Well, the sure. detailer, <laughs> the detailer, but seeing that it's the preliminary yeah. planner, it's oh, a yeah, well-planned sure. project. Like yeah. you've just given me a huge tool to get me ahead of planning where I don't go, oh my gosh, what do I do now yeah. when I'm on? So I don't have that moment of panic where I'm running the core and I go, boy, I hope we win. Oh, crap. <laughs> well, and everybody's on the same page because if, yeah. you're, if you're sharing that with the other trades that are involved on your project, right. they've all got the same data. They've all got, you're all sharing the same, viewing basically the, the, same, the same piece of information. It's everybody's on the same page. It's easy to understand. And uh, a lot of those delays and meetings that, that come from, hey, what are we going to do now? get avoided because everybody's got the same information to start with. Yeah. Well, an overhead coordination is hard enough even in a new build, but overhead coordination and something where you're like, yeah, we're just going to be tight though. If that's like, <laughs> if that's what's being said, you, and now you're doing that and you've got to avoid attaching the wrong spot. Right. Yeah. It's a high level complexity there right. and some Really good arguments that can come out of that kind of thing, depending on who showed up to site first. <laughs> I, I was I was on a I was on a job in Nashville years ago when I was in the field at a, at a hospital, and they wanted to put a linear accelerator in in this room. And uh, all my job was to lay out the reinforcing steel, and but like yeah, with, I heard heard the guys talking. Yeah, we have to go here because we know we know the floor is like eighteen inches thick in this area. I'm looking at my my screen thinking. This floor is not 18 inches thick. <laughs> and I, I, I said something. I, I'm like, hey guys, I heard you saying the floor has to be 18. It's, it's not 18. It's it's eight. And they're like, no, 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 no. Just just mark out the steel, pal. Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, look, I, I, I promise you, I, I know what I'm doing here. I've done this a lot, thousands of times. I'm looking at the thickness. This this floor is eight inches thick. They're like the architect said it's 18, the engineer said it's 18, the plans say it's 18. Like, you want to go get a drill and, and we can just do a little pilot hole through here? And so I marked out, took a tape measure, marked out eight inches on the bit. And it's just like a probably like a quarter inch bit. And this guy starts you know, just drilling down. I picked a spot for him where he's not going to hit any steel. He starts drilling down and I'm watching my, my black Sharpie mark get lower and lower, closer to the ground. As soon as that thing disappeared, his, his hands just dropped. <laughs> and uh, oh no, it's only eight inches. I'm like, <laughs> I told you, <laughs> the plans aren't always what 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 they what what they're indicated to be. The, the, that is, the, the reality is is sometimes the plans are inaccurate, and then yeah, this is a great way to check. That is an amazing, amazing uh, little thought because so often I think engineers and architects get into this place of thinking that everything that they put on their drawings happens in the field. Yeah. There's this complacency about it. That ain't the way it goes. There's so much cowboy crap happening out there that you're not aware of. And so checks and balancers are needed, in other words. <laughs> uh, we, we, we hear all Jeez. the time on, 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 utility, on utility jobs where we're looking for utilities before an excavation. Mm -hmm. Hey, there shouldn't be anything here. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, well, let's let's see how this goes first. But uh, you got a thirteen-two line running running through the middle of their their excavation, and the, they there there was something there. 
It's yeah. a little bit yeah. of a bad yeah. day yeah. if you yeah. hit that, right. for right. sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, you guys have done a ton in like concrete, obviously we talked through that, but like what other sorts of things are you guys doing? Because I, I find this fascinating. It's not just applicable to construction. Yeah, so we, we've, we've gotten a, a few you know, kind of weird calls. I, I think one of the, the the most unique calls, and I've got to kind of preface this that it, it's it's never been confirmed by us. We don't okay. we don't know yeah. the final result of this. This is the but conspiracy theories. <laughs> we were called to a site, um, fairly old old site. I mean, mm-hmm. probably hundred years old or yeah. so. And they say we're looking for this big metal box. Like, well, how big? So, well, like the size of a room. So, like thirty foot square, maybe. And they said, yeah, that, 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 let's let's go with let's go with thirty foot square. So, we're on the site, and they give us a couple, a couple acres to scan. And we're, so, we've got this grid going, and we're, we're scanning. And finally, we we get to something like, okay, this we could be onto something here. So, we we tighten up our spacing a little bit and kind of mark out our perimeter and say, hey, look, we think we've got something here that you might be interested in. And they come over, they look at it. They say, all right, guys, time to pack up. You get out of here. You know, well, well hey, you know, what, 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 do you, what do you think this is? Because we, we want to know. We, we, yeah. we found this. Well, yeah. like, no, get in your car, go, get out of here now. And so we went back and we did a little bit of research. And all I can say is um, there was a computer built in the early to mid 1940s, that was mainframe, big computer, probably about the size of a room. And it was used to help crack the Enigma code uh, that the German submarines were using. And this facility that we worked at was involved in that project. I don't know if that's what we were, <laughs> I don't know if that's what we found, but we do get some really unique opportunities, you know, yeah. one, once in a while. We found either three or four murder victims in the in the history of our company. We just worked for Fox News you know, last year or two years ago to go underneath one of the bridges in New York because this prison informant said that that's where his dad told him that Jimmy Hoffa was buried. So, you know, Fox News had us out there this is one of the times that we've looked for Jimmy Hoffa. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you get paid for it every time, right? right, 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 right. <laughs> is that like, hey, I got another Jimmy call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I think is awesome is that you guys probably have a folder in your company that just says Jimmy Hoffa. And that just makes me so happy. Yeah. I'm just so yeah, happy yeah. inside. <laughs> yeah, he's not. He's not here. He's not here. He's like, yeah, yeah. But no, we've, we've there's been uh, no confirmation of of Jimmy on on our end. And, uh, but no, we, I think uh, Salt Lake City, Orlando, Houston, and and one more, I forget the other city. But we've we've worked with the local law enforcement department. And, and we don't say, yeah. hey, look, it's not like CSI. Yeah. We, we were on CSI years ago and we provided the producers some data on what mm-hmm. a body might look like if we were to find it. And so then we're all sitting around watching the show because a couple of our guys, yeah, they, they made the, they, they were on TV. So, um, we were all excited to see him, you know, looking, running our equipment on on the CSI show. And, you know, they, they stop and they, they kind of zoom in on the, on the screen and it's got like, the silhouette of this body and you can see the guy, his, his hands are over his face and it's all yeah. in this perfect detail. You could almost see the pores on the guy's skin. And uh, like, oh, you can tell he was buried, buried. <laughs> in a defensive position. Well, <laughs> no chance could you tell that this guy was buried in any position. Like, hey, look, this is what a body might look like if, if, if we were to find it. So when we have worked with law enforcement to find a few bodies in the past, we'll say something like this. Like, look, we're not saying this is a body, but if you are thinking that there's a body on this property, there's mm-hmm. a high likelihood that they may have been buried here. If you're going to dig, this would be a good place to start. Oh my gosh. And then we've, we've had a few times where we've said that and sure enough, they, they dig and they're generally not buried very deep. Golly, man. So, That's crazy. Yeah. That, I mean, 
you, you can't you can't even expect it that when you started this up. Never. Like that that it's, come on. Like that's that's yeah. funny. Like no, no. that's like you're on CSI or or was it C, yeah, CSI? That's yeah. it's been a while since I've watched it. Dad's and a big like, fan. Dad's a big fan. Yes. <laughs> He's gonna nerd out over yeah. that. But like these, I mean, these little fingerprints that you've had across the years, like there's no way you could have expected that. No, no. <laughs> uh, no, getting to do that. Yeah, some some other. I mean, the, my my favorite part is going to a city and like, go to New York, and we, we worked on the Freedom Tower. Yeah, and you see some of the sites that we've worked on, and get to go visit some of these sites that we worked on. Uh, you know. We've worked on some really high profile projects that I probably can't even say, but uh, it's it's really neat for our guys. I think it's one of the 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 best things about being a project manager for GPRS is you don't know what that next call is going to bring you. And yeah, you're you're using the same equipment, and it, while it might feel like you're doing the same thing every day, it, it never has this, there's no monotony to it because A, you're meeting new people, mm -hmm. but you're solving a new problem. You're, you're, you're helping to solve a new problem every day. You're at a new site every day and you get to go behind the scenes at a lot of these facilities that most people just never get to see. Yeah, yeah. So we had a guy show up uh, for the National Park System in DC. They said, hey, meet us at this golf course. So he's all set up, ready to go. He's got his equipment ready, and they're like, "Pack your stuff up. We're not. We're not going here. Just follow us." So they're kind of going into the heart of DC. They pull up, and the bollards go down in the, in the street. He follows them through. They pull up to the White House. I need you to scan the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Putting in new sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what they were doing, but he said that he saw guys looking through scopes on the roof oh, yeah. and then the, the entire time. <laughs> Keeping the, the hands visible. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, just, it's just marking paint, guys. It's just, it's just marking paint. It's, <laughs> it's like trying to go out there with a push mower yeah. and just be like, I'm just going to mow this for you. Okay, yeah. guys? Yeah. <laughs> Don't shoot me. Yeah. So, yeah we, 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 but it's, it's, the, it's things like that. I mean, there's some yeah. really neat projects that you just, wouldn't get to do. I mean, so this has taken our team into a lot of places that uh, we never would have expected to to go. I want to dig into the entrepreneurship side of things. Really, like we've, we've skipped along, but I'll really get into this here. Like one of my questions, if I'm looking at this from the standpoint of being a young entrepreneur, and I'm sure a lot of other people wonder this too, is like, who is the first person that you hired? That was like, this is a game changer for me. And then you started going, I can build from here. Like who who made that shift? And I'm sure it'll be different for a lot of people. You don't have to t say a name or anything. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, a, yeah. there's, there's, there's a few points along the way. So the first person that I hired, right? And, and that's a huge commitment. Yeah. Because we're this small company. And I mean, at the time we were like maybe a hundred grand first year in sales. Yeah. And... So the guy I hired, uh, I played baseball with in high school and he had just graduated college. I was a senior when he was a freshman. He was a really good baseball player. So I, I just kind of took him under my wing a little bit and I really, really liked this guy. He was a hard worker and he was graduating college and I was a year into business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met him for lunch one afternoon and said, hey, I'd, I'd love to have you come work with me if this is something that you think you'd be interested in doing. So that was 2002 and yeah, John's still with us today and uh, he's done an incredible job. Um, but that first person and realizing that, hey, no matter what happens, no matter what checks come in or do not come in, you still have to make payroll. This, this guy's still going to yeah. be expecting his check. And then yeah. you still got to pay his benefit plan. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was, that was a wake up call. Yeah. Uh, and then there was another point in time. This was 2008. We were, we're still really small, probably seven or eight people and mostly Ohio. We had Ohio, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Florida. Mm -hmm. It was in Chicago. It was where we had, where we had people at the time. 
And there were two guys, you know, one of them was my, one of my best friends. Then the other one I, I worked with and was close with, you know, going back to college. Um, but right before I started GPRS, we worked together at, at another company and he was out in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of my best friends, the guy, he was a cop in Toledo. And, but he was from Virginia mm -hmm. and he wanted to move back to Virginia. I hired them within a week of each other. And uh, this is either going to be the dumbest thing I've ever done where I'm just going to run out of money yeah. or else it's going to be one of the best things I've ever done. And today, those two guys are both EVP positions where one oversees the, the work in the eastern half of the United States for us, one oversees the work in the western half of the United States for us. But yeah, there's some some pivotal moves. And I would say as far as you know, the entrepreneur side of things, there, there's a, a statement I read years ago that I, I fully, fully believe that when things go well, the CEO gets too much credit. Mm -hmm. And when things go poorly, the CEO gets too much blame. And so much of what's happened in GPRS, you know, well, I've, I've overseen it and I've, I've kind of put the vision out there for it. I've not been the one to really go execute it. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the team you surround yourself with makes really, that, that that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. And so guys like John and Jamie and Jason, the, the, that's just the three examples that I've thought of today. But that that's that's really, you know, the reason for what, what's happened with GPRS is I communicate that vision to them and then they go execute it. They build teams around them that that, that go execute it. And uh that that's how we've just been able to replicate success, you know. Yeah from one market in Northwest Ohio to 54 markets across the country today yeah. where we have people. So. Did you intend to get to 800 people? Did you plan on that? No. And, yeah. and, and, and yeah, we're, we're knocking on that door of 800 now. Of that, that, that's, that's, that's not a, that was not a goal. Of course. Um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a, that's a milestone maybe on the, on the whole journey, mm -hmm. but no, I've got, I believe in this, this, this principle that, yeah, I've got this thing. I've, I've been saying it for a long time where I want to maximize my potential, mm -hmm. but there's a problem with that. I don't think that you can ever fully maximize your potential. One of the reasons I believe that is because as you grow, I believe your potential grows as well. The better you make yourself in anything, you're raising your potential at the same time. So as the business grows, the potential for its continued growth continues to increase. And so it's, 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 a, it's a worthwhile pursuit, pursuit, but I don't think you're ever going to get there. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, our people have just bought into, into that mentality. But no, I, I remember a conversation you know, with my father-in-law standing on his driveway and we just got, I was helping him move into their, their house and we just got done unloading the U-Haul. And he said, Matt, what do you think GPRS can become? And this was a couple of years into the business. There may have been three or four of us in the company at the time. And I said, you know, it'd be really great if we could have one person in Detroit, in Detroit one in Cleveland, one in Toledo, yeah, Cincinnati, Columbus, Chicago, and if each one of those guys were doing, you know, a couple hundred thousand a year in revenue, that'd be a great business. Mm -hmm. And it would have been, it, it, that would be a great business doing maybe a million and a half, two million a year. Um, but we've just been blessed beyond that. And mm -hmm. it, it didn't stop there. And instead of having one guy in Chicago, we have 15. And yeah. instead of having guys just in the kind of that Great Lakes area that I talked about, we've gone nationwide now and it's uh it's, it's been incredible but i still think that we're we're just really scratching the surface on what this looks like long term at a certain point it starts growing by itself and it's not because of like that initial growth feels like you've you've really got to put your shoulder into it right oh <laughs> so much and that and that's where i'm at right now which is just like all right shoulder in like we're just pushing as as hard as we possibly can but then at, at a certain point it starts to flip to where it's like, okay, now it's kind of doing its own thing and it's starting to grow beyond what I expected. Like, is was there a, a number for that? It was like, oh, we hit 50. And then at that point it was like, oh, the flywheels, it's spinning now and it's starting to kind of operate itself and things are starting to grow. Yeah, there's a few things that come to mind. But yeah. As you were asking the question, uh, 
I remember the first, uh, this is no joke, the, the first five years of the company, mm-hmm. every single day, I questioned if this was a long-term viable business. And we talked about the Trump Tower yeah. earlier. We got that Trump Tower job and that was $117,000. That was by far the biggest job that we'd ever done at, the, at that point in time. And it was like, it was like, by 15% of our year. Yeah. And, and, and back in 2006. And uh, yeah, boy, I'll, I'll never find another job like this one. This, 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 was, this was incredible. Well, yeah, we've done several jobs that have been seven figures. Yeah. And I remember I was on a flight once and I was reading a book called Becoming a Coaching Leader. And Talking about how to coach your team and how to how to you know, create vision and, and communicate that vision to the people around you. And the author in the book, he has actually instructed the reader. He said, "Hey, I want you to think of a goal that seems impossible, like a goal that you just never be able to reach, and just write it down, and then write down you know why, what are the obstacles that, that would prevent you from reaching it." So this is I don't know ten years ago, and. Uh, I wrote down, yeah, I don't, I don't think we could ever do a hundred million dollars in a year mm-hmm. in, in in revenue. And uh, so then, I write down a few things underneath it. Open the book back up and, and start your reading again. And on the next page, it said maybe one of your goals was that you could never do a hundred million dollars in revenue. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. So. I changed. I, I I changed my passwords, or I'd, I'd make my I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd make my passwords you know, revenue goals, where it'd be at you know, twenty million in two thousand fifteen, yeah, thirty million in two thousand sixteen. Yeah. I'd, I'd 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 changed my my passwords, so I, I was always thinking about these these revenue goals, and yeah. you know, we broke a hundred million several several years ago, and I think we can grow this to do a billion dollars a year in annual revenue now. I hope you didn't give a password away there. <laughs> we can cut that out. <laughs> you, you blamed yeah. Toledo, like pre, uh, pre-podcast, pre you blamed Toledo for some of your success. I thought it was interesting. I, I say blamed. Blamed, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's it, it was a blessing yeah. to be born where I was, be, to be from. I've, I've lived there my entire life. And yeah, Toledo's about a half million people. Yeah. It's 50 miles south of Detroit, and it's 120 miles yeah, west of Cleveland. Within a four-hour drive, you've got Chicago, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. I might be missing one or one or two. So it's in the middle of this huge population center. And I realized pretty quickly that if this business was going to grow, I was going to have to look outside Toledo. So when I hired the first guy, I put, I put him in Cleveland. When I hired John, John moved to Cleveland. And when I hired the next guy, he was in yeah Chicago or Dayton. Dayton works well because it's an hour from Columbus and it's an hour from Cincinnati. So easy to get to two cities pretty easily. I think what we were talking about earlier, if I were born in Chicago, yeah. city of nine or 10 million people, there's so much work there that I don't know that I ever would have looked outside of that area. I think I may have just been focused on building and, and just going deep in that in that market. But because we started in Toledo, it forced us to look into other markets and then quickly realized, hey, if we can do this in Detroit, we can do this in Cleveland. If we can do it in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, New York, and then up and down the whole Atlantic coast, and then out west and, and kind of fill in the middle and... It just worked. You hired the right people, you know, gave them some incentive to go grow the business, and then it just it, it filled in. One thing that we did, looking back, that I think was smart, but I, it wasn't necessarily planned or strategic at the time, was we expanded our footprint wide and, and basically had people across the country before we started going deep in any one market. And so now we have 35 people in Southern California in the, in the 35 project managers out in the field doing this every single day. Well, we were expanding into other cities, but we still only had one or two guys in Southern California. There was this world of, world of potential in front of us. But you know, 
Like, hey, let's get somebody in Seattle. Let's get somebody in Portland. Let's get somebody in Denver. And before we just start going deep in any one market. It's very interesting how that's allowed you to scale so much more. And like I said, I mean, this is interesting to me because you started in 2001. uh, ABSI started in 2003. Um, You talked about growing through 2008. Man, we... We got stumped by 2008, 2009. I mean, it was it was tough. Um, there's there's this marriage I see. Like you had you had an offering that was right for the pick, but they weren't aware they weren't aware of it. They yet. weren't aware of it. So you you got that. The, how the how the word like really get out? Yeah. When when did that hit the street where you found? I'm not like walking in having to explain the whole bit educate to everybody. literally everybody. You know? yeah. yeah, it's that 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 was the, the toughest part. Yeah, getting started. Where I remember, I, I went. I'm not going to say the name of the company, but I was I was doing sales one day in Detroit. Where just trying to create awareness, and I would I would have this list printed out. I had one of those six by six maps, like the six six foot square maps, and I'd like pick one suburb of Detroit where I'm going to go up here and I'm going to spend eight a.m. until five five thirty p.m. every single day. Just going to every contractor in in this in this one suburb, where I just stop unannounced in their office and you know, try to talk to a project manager or a superintendent, an estimator, whoever I could talk to, to let them know that I had this technology and I can help them, yeah, you know, avoid utility strikes. I can help them, yeah, you know, avoid hitting reinforcing steel or electrical conduits that are embedded within or below a concrete slab. And I'd go in and I'd say, hey, my name is Matt Aston. I'm with the Ground Penetrating Radar Systems. And they'd look at me like, Ground Penetrating Radar? Like, we're not looking for buried treasure, kid. You know, we're, 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 we're laying pipe or we're, we're, we're building buildings. Yeah, we're not, take your, take your fancy equipment and go away. And I talked to this guy in the Northern Detroit suburbs and I said, look, yeah, I can help you avoid finding electrical. I can help you find electrical conduits so that you can avoid cutting them you know, every time that you're doing a renovation. And he looked at me and said, why would I ever do that? He said, don't you know that I get paid to fix all that that I cut? <laughs> wow. I'm like, okay, but what about the owner at, 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 the, at the building that you're working in? It's, a, yeah. it's this unforeseen cost to him. And what are you shutting down in his facility that you could avoid that? And it'd be such a better experience for, for the, for the owner. And so I would, that, that, that's one of the, the sales calls that just stands out in my mind. And so when I, when we were smaller, I used to like look through our invoices on a monthly basis. And whenever I saw that company's name that, that we had done that job for, I was like, Yes, <laughs> they're they're using it, and he said he would never use it because I was I was talking to, I was talking to the owner of the company at the time, and uh, so that, that that was that was a good feeling, uh, but yeah, there, there was that was that was one of the biggest challenges was just trying to create this awareness and get people to yeah. understand that this was a viable technology to use in construction applications to help with damage prevention, and. It was it was a years long process. I like the humility with which you you have approached this. Like you didn't set out saying, you know, I want to build this gigantic business, but you had a need that resonated with people. And so I would imagine that serving the need was probably a, a big tenet of why you grew. Like the the growth was actually growing to serve a need, not growing so that the business could be gigantic. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I was, my daughter was born in July. I, the reason we started it in September is because my wife wanted to have health insurance you know, through through the time that my, my daughter was, was born. So I waited till September and you know, that was up and running. And my goal, you know, my wife was a teacher and she called me at work one day before GPRS and she said, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant. And we'd only been married two years at the time. Our plan was to wait five years and we were just going to try to save whatever she made. And that way she'd be able to stay home with kids when we, when we had them. 
Well, I knew she wasn't going to be going back to work once the once the baby was born. So my goal in starting GPRS was just really, hey, here's a, a, a new way to provide. And it's going to give my wife the opportunity to stay home you know, with, with our kids as, as, as we have them. And that, that was, that was really the goal. I just, just if, if, if revenue can be greater than expenses, that, that, that's the goal. Win. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, it it took some time. I was, uh, I was reading a book, the, the E-Myth. Have you guys read the E-Myth? Heard of it. Haven't read it yet. All right. And that, that, that's been an influential book for me for sure. Um, basically says the reason businesses fail is because the owner spends too much time working inside of the business and not enough time working on the business. And it's exactly when I was reading this book is when I was doing the Trump Tower job in Chicago. Yeah. So I'd go do the job at the day and at, at night I, I was reading this book. Like, this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm working in the business. I'm not working on the business. So while when I finished it, I started coming up with this plan this is how I'm going to remove myself from working inside the business, how I'm going to work on it. And then I hired someone to replace me. Actually, I brought John back from Cleveland to Toledo, hired, put somebody in Cleveland. And then uh, I spent the next year, I was either in Detroit, Columbus, Cleveland, Chicago, Cincinnati, every single day. And I'd go to Chicago, I'd drive you know, three and a half hours to Chicago. I did not have any appointments lined up. I just looked for tower cranes. Mm-hmm. And then I'd throw my vest on, I'd throw my safety glasses and hard hat on, walk into that job site like I knew what I was doing. And I'd walk around until I found the superintendent's office. And uh, then I, I'd just ask for 10 minutes. If I could give a demonstration, I'd give the demonstration. If they, if they didn't have time for a demonstration, I would schedule one or ask who I can talk to to set up a lunch and learn in, in their office, and uh, so it was a lot of a lot of sales time, a lot of wind, windshield time. But all those little steps, yeah, you know, that's it, made us what we are today. I I love it, man. I I love the uh, the backdrop of that and how you're just trying you're trying to do the next right thing. Uh, and it resulted in a lot of success for you. So it's, it's, but yeah. you don't always know what that next right thing is, right? So you're kind of <laughs> getting, you're guessing along the way a little bit. And, and yeah, I remember there's so my, my, I told you my strategy was to go out there and, and look for tower cranes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one day I get to Chicago and it's this heavy, dense fog. <laughs> and, I, and I can't see anything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, I'm literally driving up and down the street look, looking for like construction fencing around properties to, because I got, I drove four hours. I'm not going to waste my time here. I'm going to try to do something. And yeah, it, moving the ball, you know, two, three yards at a time and get a first down and move mm-hmm. the ball again. And you know, that, that's, that's kind of what the, and then, then winds started coming. Then people, I, th- I think of it as a this this flywheel, right? And so, mm-hmm. it, like you said, you got to mm-hmm. you got to really push to get the thing moving. But once it's moving, you know, it just it, it's it's hard to stop. Mm-hmm. And you know, so we think of it as. So I, I would I would tell our guys when when we hired a new guy and put him in a new city, you got to go out and sell any day any day you don't have a job, you have got to go out. And, and try to meet people, stop by job sites, stop by offices. And you know, he said, but our best sales call is a job well done. So whenever we get the opportunity to work, we've got to treat that customer like they could be a customer for life and they can use this over and over and over again. And that's how that flywheel just gets moving hard as, as it, every customer is an opportunity for, for more work. And now we've got customers that we do jobs for like two, 300 jobs a year. That's, uh, I could sit here for the rest of the day probably and pick your brain on this stuff, but I know you got better things to do. So uh, <laughs> we'll, I think we need to wrap it up and uh, ask you our megaphone question. Okay. All right. So uh, if we gave you a megaphone for the whole construction industry to hear in around 60 seconds, what would you want to say? 
Well, it's the sort of thing you want to soapbox on. Yeah, I, I just think that uh, it, it kind of falls back to that that potential thing. You know, we are we are capable of so so much more than we realize, and it's really easy. The world around us makes it really easy to be average. It doesn't take that much. I mean, you show up and you do what you say. What you say you're going to do you're already probably moving into that above average category. If you can show up on time and just fulfill what you say you can do, you're already probably above average. But if you just push yourself and you you find something within you, you can move into that elite category. You know, it, it, it's easier to separate yourself than what most people think. And if you just look within and, 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 and find your why and find some motivation, you can be an elite performer in, in whatever it is that you're doing. It's a good word, man. Thank Dude, you. thanks for coming down here and uh, hanging I, out with I, us. I really, I, I, that, was, that was a really, it felt like we've been talking five minutes. So that, was, <laughs> that was a really fun conversation. <laughs> this, so. this is the good ones, man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot, guys. Of course, man. Thanks yeah. for coming. 